what we would like to encourage you is think, how are you going to add at least one C, at least one C to your lesson? So we're each taking a turn with each of the C's, and we have some tips and things for you, and we're going to try and just do a few minutes, each of us. As Alice was saying, my little portion is on creative thinking. And so, friends, I'm a former school principal, and I worked with over hundred, hundreds of new teachers. I was in a high um, poverty area, high second language learning. My first language is actually Spanish. And so, in my schools, it was very challenging. So, every day, I had to challenge my teachers to think creatively. So when I speak, I speak very much from the lens of a former school principal who really cares about teachers and particularly new teachers. So when we're thinking about creative thinking, we're thinking about creativity versus consumption. So as Alice said, our own students have all these great ideas. We have great ideas. But I don't really think that in school we're taught to think creatively. I know for many, many years, I felt myself to be a very linear thinker, and especially as a principal with scheduling and lesson plan reviews, etc. and I didn't really feel like I was very creative. But then I remembered that I really had to think outside the box. And I had a coach who used to work with me, and I used to say, okay, we need to do this outside of the box. It's okay, Alicia, no, that doesn't work. We need to think outside of the box. And one day she brought me this little box. And it was a giveaway at Burger King. And when you touch the little knob at the top of the box, it says, can you let me out of here? Can you let me out of here? And she said, you need to have this for your work as a principal because you're constantly trying to get out of the box. And I want to encourage you to do that. So I really want to encourage you to do that as you're working on your own things, but especially since my brand is supporting new teachers, as you're working with newer teachers in the profession, how are you supporting them to think out of the box? And then let students come up with their own ideas. Let new teachers that you're coaching come up with their own ideas to solve problems, and you do the same. Don't let somebody tell you how you should do it. Think through it and come up with a better idea for yourself. And above all things, you need to build in time to play. We're stuck in our buildings. As an independent consultant, I'm stuck in my home office frequently, and I don't really take time to even go out and take a walk. So as we're trying to get the creative juices flowing, a lot of folks talk about walking meditation. So take a walk and use that time to think creatively. It will really be a benefit to not only you, but all the students that you serve. I'm going to talk about um, collaboration in the real world. One of the first things that you need for collaboration is clarity. Um, you need to have a purpose. You need to have a goal. I can't tell you in the real world how many meetings I've sat in where you just want to poke needles in your eye because it's like, what are we doing here? What's the outcome? Who's responsible? What are, you know, what's, what's the end game? So make sure that all of your, make sure that all of your meetings, all of your collaboration, teach kids, they have to have purpose, they need goals, they need responsibilities, and never, never, never walk out of a collaboration session with we. There is no we. We doesn't exist. I have to do something by 10 o'clock on Tuesday. You have to have something done at a certain time. Give, give actionable items, assign things to people, or things are never going to get done. Um, second thing for good collaboration is being open-minded. Um, in the real world, you're gonna, your students are going to work with a diverse group of people, religions, faith, um, age groups, you have millennials working with baby boomers, so just be open-minded. Um, there's a bunch of diversity of ideas, you know, um, respect, tolerance. Um, third thing for a good collaboration is good communication. Um, kids need to know how to express their ideas clearly, concisely. Fourth thing uh, for collaboration is just a positive work environment. People need to have the freedom to express their ideas. Um, you need to have a nurturing group. You need to be authentic. You need to be real. Build trust. Um, leverage strengths. Encourage students. Congratulate students. And build a really good team. Now I'm going to add to what Sarah said. And I just want to share with you that as the founder of New Teacher Chat, I did that for seven years by myself. 
And eventually, as I was doing it, though, going through the process, I began to be able to collaborate. And even though I was the lead and I came up with topics, I had so many friends that jumped in and would give me great ideas. They would say, Lisa, why don't you think about this idea for one of the chats? And so I ended up having some amazing collaborations with wonderful people that are in my professional learning network. And so running a chat on Twitter really takes collaboration. And that's something that I really enjoy doing. And just to share, in August, I am rebooting New Teacher Chat and collaborating with Chuck Poole. If any of you know him, he's absolutely amazing. And he's going to be joining me in August, and we're going to be launching as a monthly chat. So if you support new teachers, mentor new teachers, know a new teacher, please look for us to launch in, in August. And we're going to be inviting wonderful people like Alice, Christine, and others to join us on the monthly chat with topics that they're passionate about. If I would say if I had to pick one C, and it's so hard to pick one C because this is not the C that I'm in charge of, but to write collaborate really big at the top of your lesson plans. I'm really into social learning theory by Dr. Bandura, who says we learn more from those around us. And so we go move away from being isolated at our desk to doing things together. So as many of you know, I am like the world's number one expert in Google Classroom. I've written a few books on that. So I have a Google Classroom example. And what I want to put you in your mind is to think students can collaborate. So when I'm in Google Classroom, my favorite thing to do is to take one Google Slides and I click the tiny arrow, the tiny triangle, and I'm going to reword this. Students can collaborate. That middle option is not edit, it's collaborate. I'm desperate to get them to change the wording. Will you please click on the question mark in the left hand corner and say, Hey, Google Classroom, can you change the wording to students can't collaborate? Because if it just puts that in our mind, wouldn't we collaborate more? And I think we can find a lot of research that says when we work together, when we share ideas, that we learn better. So students can collaborate. Use that more often. Get all students on the same Google Slides. So I'm in charge of the communication. See? I'm going to move on. All right. So those of you who don't know me, I'm Christine Pinto. Here's my contact info and where I blog. So I'm going to take us through the innovating play cycle, connection, wonder, play, and discover. So start with the connection. So think in your head, like, what are the kids going to build off of? Because if we're taking something in isolation and we're going to try to build a connection with it, it's not going to work. So start with, start with the connection and uh, continue with, with wondering. So I really tried, this year I thought, how can I get my kids to articulate to me what's going on in their head? And the nice thing with littles is that they will speak their minds pretty clearly to you, but I do want them to take the time to more than just say it out loud. So literally, I give them a piece of paper like this, and I tell them, draw your face right here and what you look like, and inside of your thought cloud, what are you wondering? What does that look like? So I'm providing a thinking space for them so I can hear their inquiries and what they're thinking about. So um, capture their wonders and explore through play. So the kids need the time and the space and the trust to explore because that's how they're going to build those connections. And when they build those connections, that's how they're going to discover. And so at the end, after our project is done, Reflect on what the takeaways are. Take the time to go back. Sometimes this is a step that can be very much forgotten, but like I put the picture here of like the community circle come back and gather around as a circle and, and share out what did you learn, what was your takeaway from a learning experience. I love all the C's and it's hard because collaborate really is my favorite, but then I feel like they all just kind of tie together. Like how do you do creative thinking without really being critically thinking as well? I love this quote by Shelley Burgess, who wrote the book, Lead Like a Pirate. Live in DOK 2 and 3. Visit DOK 1 and 4. Live in DOK 2 and 3. Visit DOK 1 and 4. Now, the majority of what we've been doing is DOK 1. I remember as a math department, we, when kids would ask, when am I ever going to use this? I kid you not, our department policy was to say, well, we're teaching you critical thinking. Lies! Almost the entire math book is DOK1. Follow these steps and get the right answer. That's not critical thinking. And so we have to try and move past. How do I get past this? Follow the steps, get the answer. You really need to chart it. If you're not mapping it, you're going to spend so much more time in DOK1 than you think you are. 
But just remember, you can't cover everything. If you want to do critical thinking, critical thinking is crazy time consuming. Crazy time consuming, but it makes it stickier. Let's raise our hands. Who learned something for a test and would not be able to today regurgitate it to save your life? I would say so much of this, I'm cramming it in. We know research shows cramming, doing that DOK1 does not have that long-term stickiness that actually most of what we learn, we forget. So we have to make some choices. Do, do I want, is this important enough for them to use outside of my classroom? Then it's important enough to go deep. And you just have to make those choices. If robots can grade it, they should. So I'd like to challenge you that DOK1 is no longer your job. DOK1 is no longer your job. So I'm gonna, if a robot can grade it, if it's DOK1, I'm gonna let them do it because what makes learning better? Grit. Oh, here's a low score. Good luck on the next chapter. Give up is not good for learning. So what I love is tools that have a redo button. You're gonna do it until you're successful instead of do it till you're at the bottom of the page. Now I want you to guard your time. Doing critical thinking is incredibly time consuming. And if you try to give high quality feedback and go deep on everything, you will burn out. So I want you to choose one thing at a time that you're really investing in and having a conversation. Here is how you develop a critical thinker. You have to let them think, get feedback, and think some more. If you don't have a cycle, if you don't have a loop, you're not teaching critical thinking. It's got to be think, get feedback, think some more. Well, that back and forth is incredibly powerful for learning, but super time consuming. So you got to do more robots, more robots, more collaboration, more things that you don't have to grade because you can't do, you can't do also, you have to do instead of, you have to do instead of. So I'm going to use more robots, more collaboration, more ways that I'm not grading it. So I'm going to choose carefully if I'm going to spend my time doing something, it's going to result in some really deep learning. And if it was like some learning, I'm going to give it up. Just going to give it up. Got to choose your time carefully. Asking kids questions that you expect they will get it wrong. That it requires a caring adult with a college degree, the zone of proximal development, Vygotsky, right? You can get yourself only so far and then you need someone to help you go further. This is your job to go further. So ask questions where you're like, I know they're going to need some feedback from me. And so it's think, get feedback, think some more. And my last one is, critique the reasoning of others is critical thinking. It is higher critical thinking to analyze a mistake rather than to do something itself. So I love Google Slides because I can instantly get this every time. My role is we are a community of learners who helps each other get better. And so we're going to be in the same Google Slides and you will comment on two other students, but you can't say comment. You have to say, go to someone else's slide and make them better. You have to teach them how to critically analyze. They suck at this. In fact, adults suck at it. Or teaching a critical thinking skill is analysis, so expect really low quality comments at first. That doesn't mean they're incapable. It just means we have to teach them how to analyze. So I make critique the reasoning of others a staple in my classroom every day because every day I use Google Slides where every student is in the same slides and we comment on each other's.